how did you end up in Point Claire Village? Was it your father who was already here, or did your parents decide to move here? Or? My parents were born in the plateau, de la Nogère Street. And uh, my father, whose father worked in, uh, they also lived in the plateau, the plateau, the grandfather. They inherited a house on the lake shore by a, a rich Frenchman who uh, had a pharmaceutical company in Montreal. And uh, my grandfather inherited the house on the lake shore. And that would be uh, at around uh, the, the 19, uh, 1915, 1920. And uh, it was a summer home. They would come here in the summer because there was no, uh, back then a lot of homes on the lake shore were summer homes for uh, the well-to-do from Montreal. There was no uh, uh, infrastructure as far as water is concerned. You had to have a well, you had to have a, uh, but all of that changed in the twenties when people started moving out from Montreal. And my grandfather lived in that house from about 1915, 1920. And it's still there. It was built, the house was built in 1887. Where, whereabouts on, uh, on uh, Lakeshore Road? The exact uh, address is 211 Lakeshore Road. So when my parents got married, they, uh, they winterized the house and they made, turned it into three different uh, flats. It's a big house. A summer home for a rich Frenchman who uh, had a pharmaceutical company. And uh, uh, my grandfather inherited and uh, they, he lived here with his, he moved out here from Montreal with his family. My father, father got married probably in 1940, 39, 40. And they divided the big house into three flats. And that's where my parents uh, lived, moved. Like I said, probably in the early 1920s. And uh, the, uh, that's where I, I, I was born, that's where I grew up. There was no hospital, I was just telling Emily, there was no hospital in, in the West Island back then. So it was my- It Lachine Hospital. Uh, yes, there, it, there, there was, was but uh, my parents, being from the plateau, uh, the, the, the people in the, from the plateau used Cote St. Luke uh, or St. Luke Hospital on uh, Notre Dame Street, I think it is, and that's where I was born. But of course, uh, I moved back here after the, uh, the medical procedures. So I grew up here. I was born in 45, 1945, and I spent my whole life here. So my parents came out here probably in the, they got married probably in the late 30s, but they would come out here in the summertime. 211 Lakeshore, is yeah. it? Is it uh, it's an old gingerbread house with a very pointy roof. Is and it west uh, of St. John's? Yeah, it's just west of Cedar Avenue. I mean, yeah, west of, C of Cedar Avenue. West of Cedar Avenue? Yeah, 211. Just think of the bus and on you. On the north side? On the, yeah, because on the south side is the, is the lake. <laughs> Sometimes there's enough land. I tell people, you Sometimes know. Sometimes there's enough land. <laughs> I tell people, look, it's, my house is easy to find. Come to down St. John Road, then you turn right, because if you don't, you're going to wind up in the lake. <laughs> Sometimes there's enough land. <laughs> yeah. So then, uh, so, so you lived there? From the time I was born. Now, you, you said your mother, uh, one was French-Canadian and the other one... Is my father was uh, like a son of a Frenchman from France. My father was born here, was a Montrealer. My mother's uh, father was American and he was born in Virginia and uh, he got st after the uh, he, he, he after the civil war <laughs> no, actually 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 after the uh, the Spanish American War in 1905 oh, still he fought in that wow but uh, he got a job for the Pittsburgh Paint Company and they moved him to Montreal and he never learned French so obviously his wife and his children have to speak English in the house Oh, he married a he married a Quebecois. Yeah. Okay, so you're 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 three quarters Quebecois. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, but my mother spoke English to us when we were kids, because she had you know in their house growing up in her house they would switch constantly from French to English. So she was immersed in uh, in both languages, and so was I out here because we were surrounded by anglophones. Don't forget, point when, your, when your parents spoke to each other, they would go back and forth. Uh, no, no, my they would speak French. But when my mother took me to visit her mother on Delanoje Street, because they still had a family home, uh, with her sister who lived with the, the, the mother, they would constantly go back and forth with English and French. So you were were you bilingual? From oh yeah, my mother and I grew up on American TV, you know. And I, uh, my mother spoke English to us uh, on a regular. When he, whenever she got mad, she switched to English. So she she always had one foot back home. Well, she would visit her mother, but uh, no, we, she she stayed out here permanently, and uh, she would visit her mother and, and her sister, who remained in the family home on Denarjea Street. 
So you said uh, so you bought the house from a, a rich. Uh, he inherited. Yeah. He didn't buy it. He inherited, oh, he inherited the house, and uh, and that area yeah. would have been considered uh, predominantly English. Uh, you were outside the village, yes. So how how far outside the village? Oh, it, just to Victoria Avenue. Um, East of Victoria, you're, you're already considered in, in cottage country? Brunei, uh, there, no, there was a few French people maybe as far as the old Edgewater Hotel was concerned because there was a doctor there who owned the, uh, the, that, that house before it became the Edgewater Hotel. And he was French, and there was a few French people along the lake shore, yeah. But as soon as you went back up St. John's or, uh, or anywhere near the, the 20, it became Anglophone. So the French were really in this pocket? Well, yeah, the lake shore and... Uh, the village itself, that's right, yeah. Well, in, in my time, I, I'm uh, talking about, uh, if you go back to Cedar Avenue, it was developed by a Swedish minister, a Protestant minister, who started a church there called the, uh, the, 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 Presby uh, the Lily Memorial Presbyterian Church, right. which is still there, by the way. Some of it still remains. They haven't uh, torn down the, the building completely. And uh, so up Cedar Avenue, it was all mostly uh, Anglophones who worked in Montreal, who bought homes in the West Island, took the train home at, in the evening, and came down to the, uh, got off the train, came south, uh, and their houses, because Cedar Avenue, St. John's, uh, some of the other streets here were, were all developed uh, before the 50s. You're talking about development after the First World War, 1920. In, in, between, in between the first two uh, yeah. World yeah. Wars. So around yeah. the same time, when they started developing Valois, when Milroy went, went Valois, up there. yes, probably was developed at around the same time. I had uh, I have pictures of Bill Keane there, who had a general store in Valois Bay Avenue. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Is he the same guy who was in charge of the water filtration? Yes, he was. Uh, he worked there later on, but early on in the in the thirties, I have pictures of him driving a school bus. He had contracted with the school. Yeah, and a horse and buggy. I and a horse and buggy. I have a, I painted a painting of yeah, it. Yeah, okay. I, I've seen a picture of that as well. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the, the, the blurb was he was going to Valwa to get the kids yeah. to bring them to uh, Cedar Avenue where the school uh, where is. Where the school was before they built Valwa Elementary. So this no, is no, they still the, the, the Cedar Park uh, school still existed. They've changed the name of it now and now it's called Clearpoint. Right, but this is this is before they had the school in um, in Valwa. In Valwa, I don't know when it was built. To, uh, they bought the land in, because they're having their centennial. I think they bought their land in 22, uh, and then the first year was 22, 23. Was the first school year in Valwa? Yeah. Yeah, but the school here was always in operation from yeah. the uh, from the 1895 or 90, 90, somewhere in there, late 90s, and they built the the uh, the, the brick school. Uh, it opened up in 1921 or 23, and then kids would come from Beaconsfield, because they were bused from Beaconsfield coming east, and then Mr. Keene would pick up kids with his bus in the summertime and a horse-drawn wagon in the wintertime, and from Valois uh, working west into that school, Cedar Park School. Being Catholic, yeah. I'm guessing, that would put you more in the demographic that it was predominantly village rather yes of course rather where you live was i'm assuming was mostly protestant yes so these kids would go to cedar but you were going to yes uh, at the time what was it called when you went to elementary school there in the village here yeah. it was called the saint joachin after the parish the parish the church controlled areas of uh, i don't know how you uh, the system works uh, are you familiar with the the church controlled uh, the parishes the the the, the church is still the building right yeah, there yeah. and it extended as far as almost St. Anne's back then because yeah. even people farmers back in Grand Saint Marie would come to church here because the parish extended their their uh, authority that far and Kirk, <coughs> most of Kirkland and Dollar and yes Dollar. and up to uh, there was another parish I believe in Dorval but uh, yeah if you were French Catholic you went you went to this school and, and what high school was available at that time M uh, my father who worked in construction was would build schools and we built, he built the school here that's still there in 1954. But by then it was still too small, so they opened up St. Thomas in 61. So before St. Thomas, you continued your education in the same location? Uh, only when they built the school here in 54. Before that, you went to grade school in the original building, which is the, the, the one the closest to the lake on, on this side, although the brick has been redone, but that was the old Bergevin Hotel. And, and that was torn down, right? The, yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I have pictures of that. 
And uh, the, but the old school, the brick school built in the 30s, I went to, that was a grade school, it only got up to sixth grade. After that, you had to go to Lachine to go to high school. Is it that, uh, is it on Provo, uh, that one? The, the one in Lachine? Yeah. I have no idea where the, the kids, high school okay. kids went. My brother went there because he was older than me. Yeah. But I don't know which school they went to. I don't know. And what, when did you, were you there in 61? At, uh, you must have been there in When they opened up the high school in St. Thomas, I was there, yeah, the first year they opened it up. It was an H, an H form, and uh, we were the French uh, boys, Catholic, it was all Catholic, it was an, uh, all the kids were Irish, and they were next to us on the H, and then there was girls across the other uh, wings of the H, French, uh, 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 French Catholic, and the Irish uh, Anglophone girls. Was there tension? Because I'm assuming before St. Thomas, the French and English never really had to... Uh, not in my day that much. I mean, the usual... Uh, you, know, you know, it's funny you, you mentioned that, but uh, if, if, if you were like me and you, you were bilingual, you, know, you, you had friends on both sides and you sort of like uh, had to adjust to, uh, to where you were. I mean, you know, you, you acted like uh, you were an Anglophone with the English and you acted like a, Fr a Frenchman with the French. You were the chameleon here. In the well, West, in, in West a way, West. that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and you didn't get involved so much into the, uh, into the, the, uh, the, the confrontations and the insults and the, the usual name calling, you know, frog and, uh, you know, pea supers and all that. But I lived through it, but uh, I, I was able to adjust because I was bilingual quite, quite young. But there was definitely uh, a, a bad blood between the two groups, yeah. Was there a, a, like a chartered bus or something for you to get to school here? That we, we, we didn't have a school bus until, uh, I, I would guess, the fourth or fifth grade. And it was the concierge of the school that drove it. There was no organized bus transportation. I would walk from my house, it would take about... Uh, depending on the speed you walk, of course, you're looking at 15, 20 minutes, so I had to start off early. But uh, we got the school bus probably in, in fifth grade, and the concierge was the driver. Were there many kids out that way? How far, how far out did the students He He live? would, uh, he would uh, end the run at, uh, at the end of Lakeview. You know where, where just past the, where the Maples was? Yeah, yeah, Lakeview, yeah, yeah. it gets onto Lakeshore. Yeah. He would turn up that street and do kids up and down Fifth Avenue and uh, uh, what else is there over there? Bay, Bay, Bayview, Bayview and, uh, and then come back along the Lakeshore, pick up around Lakeview, go up near the highway, Salisbury, all those streets near the highway, and then come back down to school. Would these have been um, the English uh, Catholic kids as well? No, no, this was only for the school here, only for the uh, French Roman Catholic. So where did the, where there have been any Irish Catholic in those days? No, there was no English being taught in the school here. The Irish, geez, uh, that's a good question. Where did they go to school? Uh, they, they must have gone to the, uh, to the Protestant Cedar Park School because there was no other school. And then they opened up St. Edmund's, but that was quite a bit later. Because St. Edmund's is a Catholic uh, English uh, uh, church, and there's a school right, right next right, to it. Right. But that was built in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm, when I was in school, it was still the English Protestant. Yeah. The, like a school at, bus. At St. Thomas, school we had school buses because St. Thomas would take in kids that were more than a mile away, which I believe was the distance determined by, determined by the school commission to transport kids. You didn't expect kids to walk a mile to school every day. It would have been too, 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 too far. So you said um, uh, when you moved there, um, that area started to be developed maybe about 30 years before you were born, let's say, give or take. Yeah, in the 30s, yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and so, but but I'm a, but how far did you have to go until it was just barren? North of life? north of the tracks, north of the highway. So everything between you and Valwa, you'd say there was some yes. residential action happening. Yeah, it was mostly residential homes, single family homes. Probably built after the First World War, uh, you know, maybe a bit before, you know, 1915, 1920, 25, somewhere in there. And everyone was starting to winterize their homes by that point. Yes, yeah, it, it, was, it became more permanent. Uh, originally, I, I read in, this, in the history books that the, uh, the school, uh, Cedar Park School, uh, only, only had about, uh, you know, 40, there was only two classrooms, and it was separated by a curtain. The original one. The original one built in the, the wooden building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we have pictures of that. Mm. So most of your friends growing up, were they living in, in that area over there? Or yeah. were they more over here? Well, I had friends in the village and I had friends around my area who were Anglophone. I remember the Reader family, or they were friends uh, when I was young. And uh, 
a few other people that I know. Jeffrey Barks was a friend of mine. He lived up on Cedar. But mostly, uh, our social circle was mostly in the village. So the village, this was downtown? It was downtown, and uh, it, it was basically the, the, the center of commerce for the lakeshore. Don't forget, back, back, like I just told you, north of the 20 and, and the tracks was farmland. Nobody, almost nobody lived there except farmers. Hi, Johnny. Most, most of it was farmers, so there was almost you know, no population for, the, for this uh, area, of, of, uh, for the space there. Most of the people lived along the lakeshore, you know, obviously north of it. And uh, Beaconsfield was developing also, but uh, I'm not that familiar with Beaconsfield. But most of the people lived south of the highway, and then development uh, came after the Second World War. That's when they, they had the McGill uh, project you know, around St. Thomas High School. All of those houses were built in the 50s. Yeah. And, and along St. Louis Avenue. And uh, are you familiar at all with the veterans' homes along St. Louis? Yeah. But they were built for, for returning veterans after World War II. So with that's big when... big lots. Yeah, sorry? With big lots. Yeah. Gigantic uh, like quarter acres, I guess. Uh, must be about that. So if it's, it's a sunny day like this, and you're 13, 15 years old, yeah. is the plan to come to the village, or are you going above the tracks to roam around like no uh, no no not north of the track there was nothing to do basically if you had friends you would visit them wherever they lived and then you know we would play ball in the summertime uh, baseball was the popular sport and we didn't know any soccer or, uh, or basketball very few basketball players so we'd have a ball glove and throw the ball around or you know there was <coughs> excuse me there was parks everywhere kinsman park where, where, where uh, near where i live and then uh, uh, Killarney is, there's another park there, so we, we used to hang around there or, or just w walk around, really, you You're know. making it sound very innocent. Was everything very innocent? Well, <laughs> and don't forget, these were Catholic times <laughs> when the prospect of sin had very dire consequences. Was that really a looming thing? Oh, absolutely. Even as, even as young teenagers? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the church uh, still held in the 50s, the church was very powerful. And I remember, you know, you had to go to confession. I'm not going to confess you right now what I used to do, mm -hmm. but uh, you had to go to confession and then you had to admit to the priest, you know, if you'd been naughty or not. Um, so did you, you were. Did you serve as an altar boy at the. At no, the... no, I, I was not uh, the, the type to do that, no. no. Well, in the summertime, we, we were basically bored. <laughs> <laughs> there was no social organization. There was a park right where the Bowling Green is, you know, Delord Street, behind the, the studio over there, where the, the, the lawn bowling is, and was a, like, like a, a park that was financed and supported by L'Amical, which was, uh, I guess it was supported by local businessmen and uh, people involved in, in sports. And there were softball games there organized. In wintertime, there was a, a hockey rink. You could play hockey there. This is uh, before they built the, that apartment building? Oh, yes, much that, before. That's where the park would have been? Yeah, well, you, consume that space you interviewed, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Julien. 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 Yeah. Alain. Uh, and uh, I remember seeing him play hockey there on the rink, and I admired him because he was a goalie, and I was a, you know, uh, uh, I wanted to be a goalie too. And uh, I remember him being quite good, and I was impressed with him. But, but the, he used to play there. The footprint doesn't seem so big, or is it only because there's a building there now that it's hard to? No, the the land went all the way from just behind uh, the studio, where yeah. the uh, uh, right, right from there all the way to Delord. Okay. And then all the way to the curling club. So the land was quite big. Yeah, the curling club was there. The lawn bowling wouldn't have been no. there at the time. No. So, uh, but this is when the water filtration plant was already there. Yeah, that was built in the 60s. So that, that park is already long gone. Yeah, it was called, uh, originally it was called the Parc La Roque. Yeah. After a mayor of Point Claire, Monsieur La Roque. You're old enough, uh, maybe you're old enough to have I was born in 45, so in 55 I was 10 years old. So, but by, by the early 50s, they're already talking about the lake being polluted. Oh, absolutely. So, but, but was that kind of, did you turn a blind eye to it until a certain point? Uh, did you go swimming in the lake? No, because we were warned that you could catch polio, which was a, uh, a disease, right? Polio, and then they started giving vaccine for polio. 
But if you went into the lake, the water, there was all of these green slime growing along the shore everywhere when I was, I grew up on the lake itself, right? My house was on the lake. So we would play with boats and we had a little dock there. We'd, we'd put boats on strings and pull them along. And Boats made out of, uh, you'd make them out of Oh wood. yeah, homemade the boats, yeah. And uh, we played there, but we did not dare go in the water too much. Uh, you could go maybe with your, up to your knees or something because it was all sand mostly and it was shallow. You could walk out, you know, 20, 30 feet and it'd still be in sand. But uh, that in the 50s with all the industry and the lack of protection, uh, they brought in some very serious rules eh, in the 50s and the 60s to clean up the water. But before that, up until the 50s, the water was, was dangerous. So you're telling me in the 50s and 60s they bring in these rules and then when, by the time I'm a kid in the 80s, yeah. it still wasn't enough to get that water clean? Well, look at it this way. Uh, people now who go fishing are told, you know, don't eat too much fish that you come out, it comes out of Lake St. Louis. Because don't forget, the, the Lake St. Louis, the St. Lawrence River, is water that comes, it comes in from the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are full of industries, you know, in the northern U.S., in the Michigan, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, Chicago, all of these, uh, you know, cities have industries that pollute. And although they, now they've forced some restrictions on how much, you know, how they've got to clean their water that they dump in, their, in the system. But Lake Erie, for, to give an example, was one of the most polluted lakes in the, in, in the world up until uh, the 50s or 60s. Then they... they uh, they force companies to, you know, to not dump, you know, you know, dangerous chemicals in the lake because they would just dump it in there, and it would wind up here, of course. So uh, they did clean up the water a little bit. People go swimming on the sandbar in the middle of the they lake. Go, they go now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit now. Yeah. Well, if you're out, if you're out where there's more current, it's probably not as bad. But if you're in the bays, the water becomes stagnant in the bays and uh, the stench comes up in the spring. So do you remember like the remnants of? that era before yours? Oh, was yeah. it still when looming I, around? And yeah, there was in the summertime when the water was down, you'd see the, this this, uh, this flotsam on the surface. You know, this green stuff, this green slime uh, just below the surface. And it would, it would down, uh, it would just stick to rocks and, and everywhere. And you, did, you didn't want to go in the water. And did you still see the, it was a bit more uh, east, but did you see the stilts sticking out of the water where the country club was? Yes. That was still there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, but a few years ago, the water was very low in the lake here. And I, I, I drive by the place once in a while, you know, because I, I like history. And uh, the, the water was so low that year that some of the, t some of the cribs were showing. Cribs? Yeah, cr crib. You know what a crib is? Like uh, a baby crib? Uh, no. Uh, a crib is r like railroad ties, you know, eight inches high by about uh, eight inches, uh, ten inches. Oh, and they're uh, eight feet long, and they would make a, 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 a box, you know, they would pile it like this, two like that, and make a box, and they fill that with rocks. And railroad ties are full of creosote, they never rot. And once that's filled with rock, it becomes a very solid base that will last a, a long time. The, uh, if you go to the Yacht Club, you'll see the, the clubhouse is built on cribs. They might be underwater now, but uh, you, you might see some of the top of them. Is that what they, did they take those cribs from the uh, the tracks that were on the pier? Probably the uh, no, I, I don't think so. I, I don't know about that. But uh, you're talking about the the, the uh, carrying the stones down the pier the to build the, to yeah. build the grand trunk. Uh, people think it was a railroad, but it was uh, it was tramways that they used to carry those things, which, which are not that heavy. The stones were much heavier than the the. the than the tramways. The tramways were just basically the frame with the flat top. They would put, I think, a maximum of two stones because a geologist friend of mine told me each stone that built the Victoria Bridge piers, they, I think they weighed you know, a, 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 more than a ton or maybe two tons. So with two of them on there, that's all the tramway uh, cars could take. So you're, so by the time you were a teenager, there was a movie house in town. Yeah. There were things to do. There was maybe beer that you'd like to drink. Well, uh, I, 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 by the time I was of a drinking age, the Fairview had opened up, yeah. and there was Maryland's Lounge. Mm -hmm. You know Maryland's Lounge? But the, the, the question I'm getting to is, where did you get your money from? from uh, I told you, my father built schools, and so uh, you know, I didn't have a stipend as such, but if I say, Dad, I, I want to go and buy a dinky toy. A oh, dinky toy? Yeah. <laughs> they, they sold them in, in, the, in the stores here. Where was the, what was the toy, which store was the toy store here? The, the St. Denny Hardware's. St. Denny Hardware stole, he would sell hockey sticks, he would sell uh, hunting equipment. I bought my first rifle there. And back then, I think half the, half the kids... Rifle, like a 
bullet weight rifle? Yeah, yeah. Half the kids back then had a 22. By the time you were 15 years old, you would head for the farmers and they would love you coming there because you'd shoot the, 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 the groundhog who would eat the crop. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the farmers don't like to have their crops eaten by gophers, right? So they say, oh, you want to go shoot? For children with guns. Sorry. Well, it's we were 15 years old. Back then, oh, yeah, you, were, you were considered yeah. fairly... Uh, yeah, you already had Fairly your bar mitzvah. You already had your bar mitzvah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it depended back then uh, on uh, whose family. Everybody knew each other. So then, what was your? Did you have a job here in the? No, no. My, my father had my, a, a paper route, but you, you guys were a little. My bit, father was a, a well-to-do man. I didn't yeah. need to work. I painted. I, I was an artist even when I was young. I painted. You're asking about what we would have done. Strathmore doesn't. I, really I don't know if you can see it in the, in the sun, but that's the French wire wagon on St. Anne Street here. And there was a local man who had an old Dodge. He had a vehicle before that, but he would sell French fries right next to where the Pioneer was. Which building is that? Uh, that's the there? Pioneer that got uh, torn down. Oh, that's the side of it there. Yeah, he would park his French fry when uh, French wire wagon there. And this would have been for the workers to come and uh, anybody, and uh, the the prices are there. The, the, uh, so something like this, this you're drawing this from memory. I knew the man who was there, and the street you can rebuild. You know, if yeah. you if you make a painting, you go to the original spot, and if some of the buildings are there, you, you those houses that you see on there, and the pioneer, and that that uh, escape ladder, the fire uh, escape ladder was still there. Yeah. So that's no problem. As far as the vehicles are concerned, I knew the descriptions of them, so I can recreate them easily. You can you can find them. Now let me read too. just uh, say, uh, it said here: French fries, ten cents; <laughs> hot dogs, fifteen cents. And a Coke, five cents. I'd made it 30 cents. And if you bought the trio, sell it to you for a quarter. Were, uh, w did you guys have a relationship with the Valwa guys at all? Or like through sports or something? What was that? How divided was that community at the time? Where you were, Lakeside and Valois? Yeah, Valwa. Well, I can, I can refer now to the, to the parks department. Because if you played ho hockey, house league, which means the local kids are playing, it was divided by park areas. Now, Valois was a park area, so, we, uh, so the village kids would play against the Valois, and then Lakeside Heights got developed, and, we, and that was another uh, uh, hockey team there. And uh, there, was, there might have been another one somewhere. Oh, Clearpoint had, a, near where I live now, Clearpoint was, a, was another park. So there was a four or five parks in, the, in, in Point Clair village, or in, in the area. Lakeside Park is the one that's still there now, yeah. right? I think that's early, uh, mid-50s, early mid-50s. Well, it's, it goes back to quite a, quite a while. Lakeside Heights was developed in the 50s because the, the, the St. Louis Street was, like I said, for the veterans, so you're looking at, you know, after 45, 50. So Lakeside Heights Park developed. So you, so after growing up in that house, did you always stay in Point Clair? Yeah. I traveled around to do different jobs. Uh, in the summertime especially, I'd go out uh, working, but uh, mostly I, I lived most of my life in Point Clair. I traveled around in the summertime, the summer job. I drove a truck out in the Gaspé Peninsula for a while. I was working for the provincial government. I drove to Naranda, out the, the, the Timiskaming region. I drove a truck there for a while, and, uh, and then we, uh, the Eastern Township, and then the, uh, the Laurentian area. So I, you know, I traveled around a bit. So but besides, I, saying, I always lived here. Yes. Besides saying Point, because Point Claire is your home. Yeah. What's the reason why you never left and why you're still here? Well, the reason most people leave home usually is because to find work, your job calls you to go somewhere else you know, more often than not. And uh, there were local jobs here, and uh, I was not uh, that educated at that point. Remember, I, I took art courses when I was young, and uh, I, I was not good at high school because uh, artistic types don't take well to the algebra. I hear you. <laughs> so I, I flunked in high school and the old man said, well, you, you want to be an artist? You're going to be an artist? He sent me to art school. And of course, that, you know, the income in art is, is not that regular. So, uh, you know, I had to find all jobs and uh, I worked at the yacht club for... This a graphic design and stuff, I guess. Yeah, it was commercial art. The, yeah, commercial, commercial art. art, but you never think commercial art, I guess, when you're... Well, uh, the, the, some artist. of the paintings you see are commercially oriented because uh, you you uh, you don't do any uh, abstract stuff when you do commercial art. If someone wants you to, to sell, you know, if someone wants to sell air conditioning units, you have to, to draw the air conditioning unit. You can't do abstract work, right? A lot of the articles and advertisements in the Lakeshore News in the 50s yeah. are pieces of art. It's unbelievable yeah. what they, like uh, uh, Cousineau, uh, you know, it's, there's a guy painting 
uh, his uh, tiles on his roof or they're doing some putting up new blinds or you yeah. know and for that from labras and all this yeah. and it's all relief it's all drawings yeah you think these were all local guys that, that they got probably not i don't know of any commercial artists in point Lair back then in the in the 50s it, they might have hired people from montreal to do that or the lecture news uh, uh, Freeman was the guy, the guy's name who started that uh, paper. I forget his, uh, his, uh, his first name now, not George. Ed, Ed Freeman? And anyways, uh, he, might, he, he probably knew pe people in the uh, paper industry and he would have known of, of uh, who could have done artwork for his paper. So he probably uh, hired people like from the, either the Gazette or the Star. Or so when did, you, when did you start to see a, a change uh, in the village uh, going from, I guess, the downtown, the central yeah, the, place, yeah. to uh, things were moving north. When they built the 40. When they built the 40, uh, early 60s, I remember I was one of the first, I was in art school back then in 61. I had an old, uh, my vehicle was a World War II military jeep. And I remember the first day they opened up the 40, I was alone on it. From Point Claire, St. John's Road, all the way to art school downtown along the Metropolitan. I, I don't think I saw more than three or four cars on the 40, because it had just opened up. And then when the 40 opened up, the industrial park opened up, the Fairview opened up. And the Fairview spelled a death knell for Point Claire Village, because it had all the stores there. Uh, have you ever heard of Pascal Hardware? When Pascal Hardware opened up, there was three hardware stores here in Point Claire. They started going downhill. They could not compete with a huge, you know, department store that sold everything at Pasco. So, uh, what about what about when the plaza opened up, the Point Claire Shopping Center? Oh, that that didn't hurt at all because uh, it was small. It was mom and pop stores, you know. The Fairview had big shopping centers. There was even a, a men's clothing store in the village here. But how can they compete with Harry Gold and and uh, Eaton's and Simpsons? And uh, they could not compete with those people. So the, the village went down, started going downhill as soon as the ferry opened up in 65. You know, people had to improvise. Gift, gift uh, shops started to open. You know, people that wanted to improvise. So, And the, the Rossies on the corner of, uh, it's now a parking lot, but yeah. Rossies across the, uh, the Point Lair Hotel, or the, the Pioneer, was a five and 10 cent store. We used to go there a lot to buy stuff because it cost next to nothing, you know. You could buy, uh, you know, uh, you could buy gum for a nickel and uh, you could buy uh, underwear for, for two dollars and uh, yeah. so, so it was a popular store yeah. but they could not compete again with you know with the, the Fairview so uh, the, the, the village uh, it, it's a uh, its role as a central place for people to come and buy stuff ended in the mid 60s with the 40 and the, the, uh, the Fairview shopping center and uh, yes you would say the same about Valwa village yeah Potential. the Fairview served don't forget the Fairview probably served the whole West Island yeah. So uh, even up until uh, you know Saint Anne de Bellevue, which was also a, a thriving yeah. place. Well, when I see in the paper, Saint Anne's looked like like I totally missed the dance. Like, Saint yeah. Anne's looked like it was it eclipsed uh, Point Claire and Valwa in its uh, size. Yeah, it was the end of the island, and then after that, you had to take the bridge to El Perro, which was the boonies really. And so there was a hotel there. There was a Larry Mulcahy, Larry Mulcahy was a wrestler. Yes, and he had a hotel there. He advertised all the time in the Lakeshore News. Never wore a shirt in the pictures. No, oh no, of course not. He was a wrestler. <laughs> he was a wrestler, and of course, if you went there, uh, you didn't make any trouble, right? Because you could get bounced easily by Larry Mulcahy's friends. <laughs> but you could park your boat behind the hotel. You can walk up there and uh, and uh, do your thing in the bar. And uh, there was the Dao store. I think it just sold. Yeah. It was there for a long time. Yeah, yeah. They had the tram. Uh, yeah. Up in the top, eh? And, yeah. Uh, and there was the Rex Theater. Now, the, the building that's here... Uh, yeah, the Lafayette. Is that the actual... Yes. So the building it's itself... We're, we're in the sun. It's, it's too bad. The, I'll the I'll building itself didn't change. It's just what, what's inside changed. Yeah. Well, they, they, they removed the, uh, the marquees. You know, the marquees with all the lights? Theaters back then had a... Uh, Can you give a little context to what building we're talking about for the audience? A little bit? We're talking about the movie houses in Point Claire. And there was only one. And it was uh, called the Point Claire Theater. Yes, it was. And the building is still there. Yes. And it's Lafayette. Uh, it's Lafayette, it's, it's Lafayette Coffee Shop. It's too bad we're in the sun, otherwise. Does it consume the entire? Uh, it occupied the. Okay, there it is, right here. I don't know if you can see it. This is a painting I did. People are waiting to get in in uh, early evening. 
Can you see it at all? Wow, well, of course. And there's a Cadillac there, 59, because it, it uh, that painting is basically uh, indicates 1959. People are waiting to get in under the uh, lights. There's a marquee overhanging the sidewalk. There's an old provincial bus that used to take you to, to downtown. This is unbelievable. And the two buildings beyond are all gone. The, oh, the, the one is the hall. Rossi, the, the, the brick building is the Rossi, and the white building was the old city hall. Yeah. Wow. So this is, so this is... So if you look at the building, uh, it, it, uh, without the marquees, it's, it's almost the same, really. And uh, you climb up a few stairs. There was a bit of an incline, right, for the, for the seats. So that, they eliminated that. How many movie houses, how many theaters in there? Oh, it was just one, one, just one. And the Rex? The Rex uh, was a bit smaller, probably, but we didn't go to the Rex that much. You know, the, the movie house here was uh, was good enough for us, and it was opened up by uh, a very interesting man. Yeah. And uh, his name was Maurice Arpin. Uh, have you heard the name? He was the mayor. Yes. In between Olive's two runs. Yeah, Maurice Arpin, and then he would make sure that nobody. Uh, he would, if you know, if you got too close to your girlfriend. He would say in, in an accented English, hey you there, no monkey business in my theater. Yeah, Maurice Arpin made sure that there was no hanky-panky going on in his theater. But it must have been the hub of teenagedom. It was, yes. Well, the hub, yes, it was very popular, obviously, because you couldn't go in there, or get away from your parents and neck with your girlfriend. What about, uh, was there a clubhouse in that area where there was dances in the evenings? The only thing I, uh, not really. My brother used to hang out uh, behind where the old police station was. There was a municipal garage. There was only four doors. Uh, Point Lair had four trucks back then. And on the, se on the second uh, story of that building, the YMCA operated a, a, a room for kids to go and dance. Oh. I don't know. I don't think they served alcohol, but uh, they could hang out. My brother used to hang out there. Yeah, because these memories that people told me were from the uh, from the late fifties. Yeah. About late 50s. Yeah, the uh, YMCA had a, a, a room there. You went up the stairs out, up, outside, and then you went in, and there was a fairly large room because it was a four-car, four-truck garage downstairs. So there was a fair amount of room. And it was still there, uh, well, I think they tore it down probably uh, in the mid-60s. When they, when they moved, when they moved to, Don, to Donaghenny. Uh, Gigi's and lasting impressions in the public. Oh, we're, we're at Gigi's. That's yeah. true. We should have yeah. mentioned that. Now this, you're saying, you told me in a previous conversation that this exact footprint was a, uh, a, a, a the bus depot or, or where yeah. you buy tickets. Well, the, yeah, this is an extension in the back. See, the original building is where the, the funnel is. Yeah. And that's where it ended. But then he extended because he was got very busy, Johnny did. And then he extended in the back for the, uh, you know, more staff and the more kitchen area. Because uh, starting just about halfway in that building, there would have been a shop extending to that telephone pole Originally, it was a bakery in the old days, and then it became a welding shop where people built wrought iron fences. And that was in operation until the, probably the 60s. But the, originally, it was a, a bakery. This building? Or this? Well, right it's here. gone. It would have been right here. Whatever. From the telephone pole to about uh, 10 feet inside that extension. And Gigi's itself, this building, would have been... The, the Gigi itself uh, was uh, the original building there. It did, there was no extension back then. And it was the, as far back as you can remember, was the, the bus ticket uh, place? They, uh, they operated until uh, the, the bus depot was, uh, you know the parking lot on the other side? There was a bus depot there. They would put their buses in there. They had a garage there for the buses. So they would turn that corner with difficulty, obviously. And uh, the drivers would hang around. There was a, a, a bar with stools, and uh, it was a restaurant. You know, uh, originally I think they uh, <coughs> they made jam. I have a picture of the place of this place when it was operated by the Legacy family, Legacy, and they were confectioners. So they made candy, cakes, and uh, whatever. And it consumed uh, like it was the whole house. No, it was only about half of it. The other half was uh, I forget what the other half was. Wonder, do you, was this a residential, you think, originally? Upstairs, yeah. There was, in the village, it was the custom to have a business downstairs and live upstairs of it. This was a common, you know, in Montreal. Yeah. Because uh, then you could live uh, where you work, right? So you could, all you had to do was go downstairs and start the business you in the morning. You could write off your, uh, all your residents. I don't know about the tax laws back then. <laughs> I think people dealt, dealt with, with cash a lot back then. Yeah. Of course, that's not the case anymore, of course. 
Oh no, no one wants that trouble. No. So, lasting impressions of. Uh, oh, so just just to go back to Gigi. So, as far as far back as you can remember, it was making jam. Anything before that? that you uh, no. After the jam making, it became a restaurant, like uh, Jason said. It was a restaurant where they served. You know, it was a diner, and it was the bus depot. You know, they would sell you could buy your bus tickets here and. Uh, Oh, and, it was a uh, and, and, and the, the bus was exactly like the one I just showed you in the theater picture. Yeah. They were painted brown. Right, right. I think I've seen a colored picture of that. It was, a, it was a restaurant and a place to buy tickets at the same time. Yeah. Like how they have the Sears pickups in, in random, like Steve's. Yeah. Like Steve's Hardware is also a UPS store. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Where you, yeah, uh -huh. in the back. Yeah. You yeah. pick up your UPS. Yeah. So, yeah, lasting impressions Any, of Point Anything Claire. you want to say about Point Claire in general? Uh... I, I, I'm afraid that I, I hope we don't become dinosaurs. We uh, we've uh, we have politicians now that seem to be more sensitive to preserving it. I hope that happens because uh, there's a movement now in Quebec City and Montreal to preserve to stop the destruction of Chinatown. They want to destroy that. You know, you, you read about that? No. Oh, yeah, the promoters want they want money. You know, so they want to big build buildings and. Uh, so a lot of people want to save Chinatown. They don't want to be uh, to be raised and to disappear. So there, there's a consciousness now in society to 